it's great it's pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Gross from UCSF. John Gross is a professor of pharmaceutical chemistry at UCSF. Uh, his lab focuses on studying the control of mRNA decay and protein turnover in normal and virally infected cells. He received his PhD in physical chemistry at MIT, where he developed methods for biological solid state NMR under the guidance of Professor Bob Griffin. Then he moved to HMS for his postdoctoral fellowship under the guidance of Jared Wagner's lab, studying mRNA translation initiation. And he started his independent career at UCSF in 2004. John, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. And now the floor is yours. OK. Uh, thanks so much, ho Jong, for the in invitation uh, to talk about some of our recent work on uh, the HIV uh, protein VIF and how it promotes ubiquitin-dependent proteolysis of Avobec and uh, our surprising discovery that RNA is a cofactor for that process. And uh, starting out, I want to thank the people uh, who did the work. Um, in particular, uh, Yin Lili, uh, a post, very talented postdoc and biochemist, as well as collaborations with Michael Emmerman, uh, in particular, Carolyn Langley uh, and Nicholas Cesarino from the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle, in addition to um, Kaylee, who is in Yifan Chang's lab, who uh, helped us uh, with cryo-EM and Ignacia, who helped us with some modeling. Okay, so maybe APOBEC needs some introduction. Um, APOBEC 3G is a very potent guardian um, of cells against retroviruses. It's a very tight RNA binding protein. It binds the retroviral RNA and gets packaged into the capsid and in the in the in, during infection of the target cell, reverse transcription happens inside the capsid. Apobec is a polynucleotide cytidine deaminase, which converts Cs to Us in the first strand of cDNA synthesis. These are copied over in the second strand of cDNA synthesis into an A. So there's a um, hypermutation within the viral genome. Uh, so after integration, you have genomes that have many, many mutations, and this leads to a lethal genetic catastrophe for the virus. Uh, and this is a process that was, uh, APOBEC 3G was discovered by Michael Malam in 2002, and this mechanism was elaborated by Ruben Harris. And what VIF does, all extant lentiviruses encode a VIF protein that hijacks a ubiquitin E3 ligase, a cellular E3 ligase, uh, to target APOBEC 3G for degradation by the proteasome. So this is very simple. In the presence of VIF, APOBEC is ubiquitinated, therefore it's not packaged, therefore cDNA synthesis proceeds normally without hypermutation, and the virus survives. So this seems like a conflict. Um, one party is always winning. In one case, we have VIF, this viral antagonist that blocks APOBEC. But over millions of years of primate evolution, APOBEC 3G can evolve to escape the viral antagonist. Um, this limits the host range of primate lentiviruses. But of course, viruses are very good at adapting. And so an adaptation in the viral antagonist like VIF allows it to counteract. Apobac. So this is known as a molecular arms race. We're very interested in molecular arms races because Apobac 3G is a potent barrier to cross-species transmission from uh, monkeys, in particular old world monkeys, to hominid primates. And I think everyone knows that the transmission from uh, monkeys to uh, chimpanzee un underlies the ancient origin of HIV-1 because HIV-1 comes from SIV chimpanzee. So we want to understand uh, this molecular arms race and this co-evolution between VIF and APOBEC. That's what my lab has worked on um, uh, since starting at, uh, at UCSF. This is a 20-year-old problem to try to understand uh, at a very uh, 
detailed level uh, using biochemistry and structural biology. And so uh, early work identified the uh, VIF uh, binding along in BC and one of the Cullen family members for promoting A3G uh, ubiquitination and degradation. And, and later on, uh, Nevin Krogan at UCSF and my lab and Ruben Harris found an additional factor that's unrelated to Cullen E3 ligase biology, which is a transcription cofactor that VIF also hijacks. And the theme of VIF has been getting the right pieces together um, to get this uh, complex amenable for uh, structural studies and uh, CBF beta is a key factor, as is RNA. Uh, so after those discoveries, Ji Wei Wang's lab at uh, Harbin University in China determined the structure of VIF and the LOVC and the Cullen, a piece of Cullen, Cullen 5 and a CBF beta. And, but there was no, there's no APOBEC and, and that's really what we're after. And you know we want to understand uh, how HIV one was born uh, at the level of uh, viral adaptation uh, and precursors to SIV chimpanzee that allowed uh, spillover. You know, so I think that's a potent and topical question right now. Um, so one approach to to um, just going to do some window management here, maybe. Yeah, one approach to studying this problem. Uh, was taken by our collaborator, Michael Emmerman. So in the absence of structure, what one can do is uh, look for uh, diversifying uh, selection. Uh, that is uh, rapid rev evolution in host genes is a, is a hallmark of escape from viral ant antagonists or other pathogens. And so they can do this analysis and, and found two positions at position 128 and 130 that, um, are um, evolving um, over millions of years of evolution to escape antagonists like them. So presumably those contacts are on the interface. Uh, we wanted to see that. So uh, what Yin Li did, uh, careful attention to biochemical detail allowed her to obtain um, a cryo yim structure of uh, wild type uh, human A3G bound to HIV-1 VIF and uh, host factors that form uh, you know, the adapter that uh, links it to the Cullen backbone. And so in this structure, we, we can learn a lot. And, and first thing that we learned is that the residues in A3G that are undergoing rapid evolution to escape viral antagonists are indeed on this interface between APOBEC and VIP. And in particular, you see positions 128 and positions 130. And there's this network of hydrogen bonds and electrostatic interactions that uh, fully, um, fully make sense in terms of the prior genetic data. For example, uh, this residue in VIF shown in uh, green is one of the residues that has to adapt uh, from the precursor of SIV chimpanzee uh, to jump in, uh, from monkeys uh, to hominid primates. So uh, this direct protein-protein interaction interface we call the molecular arms race interface. So what, what we were curious about, of course, is this is enough. Um, and we were always skeptical that this handful of residues would, would be enough to promote a tight enough interaction for A3G to get polyubiquitinated. We know from classic work from Cecile Pickert's lab that at least for K48 linked ubiquitin, ubiquitins are required for, required for degradation. So how, such, how can such a small interface promote processive ubiquitination? And the answer comes from the structure. It, uh, it doesn't, there's more interface. Uh, and what we found is uh, an RNA molecule co-purifying with APOBEC 3G and VIF. And um, we did not add this RNA. It, it was, um, we go to great lengths to remove all our RNA from our samples uh, during purification. The molecules were co-expressed in uh, using the baculovirus insect cell system. So this was, this was a surprise. And uh, that's why we, we think of this RNA as being like a molecular glue. Um, I won't go into details on all the interactions, but you can see uh, kind of from a high level that the RNA is wedged between APOBAC3G in blue and uh, VIF in green. 
And VIF makes a variety of sequence non-specific interactions, uh, aromatic stackings with bases and salt bridges and hydrogen bonds. And then um, APOBEC, on the other hand, makes what look to be more sequence specific types of interactions. Uh, here you can see some Watson Crick base pair mimicry between the backbone of A3G and this purine nucleotide. Um, so, you know, that's intriguing. Um, APOBEC um, looks like it is binding um, purines. And so the first thing we wanted to do is just test the role of RNA. And for this, we targeted this lysine 26 residue of VIF because it only uh, uh, contacts RNA. And we did uh, a packaging assay. And the way this assay works is uh, in the absence of VIF, um, A3G gets packaged and, it, and then it can restrict. Uh, this is just a loading control, it's a capsid protein. And then in the presence of VIF, A3G does not get packaged. So what Caroline did is scanned a few different uh, handful of residues. And what she found is the only residue that could actually function was K26 uh, or lysine at position 26. So this is consistent with, with our structure. And we, we were arguing that RNA in fact acts as a molecular glue. So the question becomes, what's the origin of the glue? I mentioned it's, it's from insect cells, but more deeply is, does the RNA come from VIF or does it come from APOBEC? Or maybe, uh, and, and so we can, um, and formally it could come from neither and only be present when both proteins are, are, are bound to each other. And uh, we have the benefit from crystal structures from Xiaojiang Chin's lab of Apo rhesus APOBEC 3G published with RNA, uh, sorry, crystallized with RNA. This was published in uh, recently um, in, in December. And we can compare it to uh, our cryo-EM structure of A3G with VIF. And you can see that the adenine, there's this diadenine nucleotide that lines up quite well when you do a structural superposition. So this is one observation that argues that the RNA actually comes from A3G, which uh, I may have mentioned is a very potent RNA binding protein. Furthermore, Paul Benash's lab done, has done ClipSeq of A3G during viral in infection uh, of cells uh, and using a virus that's VIF deficient. So you can pull down on A3G and sequence the uh, cross-linked RNA and A3G binds this uh, purine rich sequences. Okay, so adenine. So again, consistent with this pocket. And then lastly, the residues that A3G uh, that, that A3G is using to contact RNA uh, are strictly conserved, okay? Uh, consistent with these residues playing uh, an essential role for APOBEC 3G function. And in fact, Michael Malam's lab has mutated these residues. Again, this is using an HIV virus that's VIF deficient. So you can look at A3G packaging. And then when residues that contact uh, RNA are mutated, say this tyrosine 125 or this tryptophan 127, you see um, uh, reductions uh, in A3G packaging. So these are you know, essential residues for APOBEC uh, 3G function. So the summary of what we have is that there are two interfaces that VIF uh, uses to uh, antagonize APOBEC 3G. One of them is strictly protein-protein interactions, and this is an interface that's undergoing coevolution, um, and uh, there's escape from a, uh, A3G residues can escape. This 128 and 130 can can vary over millions of years, and that limits the capacity of VIF to antagonize A3, A3G. But VIF can adapt, uh, and this happens over and over again, where one side is winning, the other side is losing and vice versa. So there's another interface, which we didn't know about, which is RNA. And in contrast to the molecular arms race interface, this interface does not change over evolutionary time um, because the surface of A3G that binds RNA is essential for function. So what the virus has done is evolved a way to intercept A3G where it's vulnerable and can't escape, yet, there's a protein-protein surface where it's, it's the, there's escape uh, and adaptation can occur. 
So that's the nature of the vif apobec interaction. And this is just a summary of our structural findings. We were very curious about how this module um, plays with Cullen 5. I kind of glossed over that beginning for simplicity, but our, our strategy was to use a dominant negative Cullen 5 for uh, expression and, and to get this complex. Uh, the Cullen 5 fell off during freezing. And so we wanted to understand better if the complex we captured was indeed uh, a bona fide substrate receptor for the Cullen 5 E3 ligase. And so we could engage in comparative modeling, um, you know, homology modeling uh, using uh, the Cullen 5 uh, backbone bound to the uh, uh, REH2, which is a coenzyme that adds uh, ubiquitin. Uh, this is a structure from Brenda Schulman's lab, who's done fantastic work to identify uh, the regulation of Cullens and how Cullens and coenzymes work together. And so we took advantage of that structure, plus a prior crystal structure of VIF, uh, LOBC, CBF, beta, and Cull5 in terminus to make a model of how our substrate receptor and A3G fit. The whole point of this exercise is to ask, where do the acceptor lysines on A3G that um, are required for VIF-mediated uh, degradation lie relative to this REH2 coenzyme? And here we made a model of uh, REH2 ubiquitin thioester and these lysines, which are identified by ubiquitin remnant profiling and mutagenesis uh, uh, are quite close to the thioester so if we think indeed the, the structure we determined of VIF and A3G is compatible with ubiquitination. Okay, so I'm um, just gonna summarize what the takeaways are here. Um, so the substrate for this, um, substrate for VIF is not A3G, but it's an A3G RNA complex. And then, you know, I told you about the residues of uh, A3G that bind RNA are essential and that um, VIF binding to A3G RNA is a strategy that would limit host escape. I don't have time to go into this, but we think that that interaction might be uh, quite ancient um, in terms of VIF apobec 3 g and, um, because, of, because it's so conserved. Um, and that escape is limited to this molecular arms race interface, uh, which is exclusively protein interactions. And this leads to a new model for how VIF uh, works. Um, and uh, the absence of VIF apobec 3 g is thought to form a dimer on RNA and get packaged. Um, in the presence of VIF, uh, VIF in, or viral infection, VIF will bind an A3G RNA complex. It will actually limit this dimerization process. I didn't have time to go through that. And secondly, we, in our structure, we see a second copy of VIF in A3G that's bridged by RNA. And we think this dimeric complex may also be important for VIF function, but we've not tested that yet. So it's in the supplement of our paper and that is going to be ongoing work. Um, so VIF can work in ubiquitin dependent and ubiquitin independent manners. Um, to prevent packaging and promote uh, proteasomal degradation. Uh, so I think most of you know that viral hijack of the ubiquitin proteasome system is a common strategy for suppressing um, innate immunity and, and other critical viral processes. Uh, RNA viruses and retroviruses, which have RNA genomes are widespread. So we're gonna argue maybe this is more common than previously and we previously thought maybe RNA glues will be observed in other host pathogen conflicts. Uh, it's early days. Uh, this is the first example that I know of where RNA is playing a glue role of a glue and a um, ubiquitin uh, E3 ligase substrate complex. And um, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of curious to get the imagination going about RNA how this RNA glue could be repurposed for uh, synthetic biology or therapies. And you know that's, that's something that I know is discussed in this forum. And uh, with that, I uh, just wanna thank all the members of my lab um, and thank you for your attention.